Greetings, ladies and metal and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. Do you want to see me record this live? Well, I am live every day at 10 a.m. GMT plus 2, both on Twitch and on YouTube. So, if you're interested, pop over and have a watch. Anyways, on to the story. Mondala, written by T. Marcos. No, those humans are out there again, Lemden muttered. With a sigh, Rendon looked up from his display. Still, he corrected, they are still out there. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous, Lemden shot an annoyed glare, his nictating membrane shivering over wide eyes. They were there when I went off shift. They must have rested. Rendon smirked and swiveled the screen around, calling up a time-lapse of security footage on it. Four humans, wearing vibrant orange and yellow robes, were hunched over a small patch of flooring in the secondary market. The crowd parted around them like water, clumping to watch her for a brief time before wandering off on their business. All the while, the four brightly clad humans remained. The only visible motion was the rapid, precise movements of their hands. Ridiculous, Limden scoffed. Even the humans would be in discomfort after that long. The other supervisor chuffed out a quiet laugh and swiveled the screen back. <laughs> Tell them that, he said, if you're so concerned. I will, Limden got up. Yet you're still talking to me. A mistake I keep making. I won't be long. Limden ducked out of the officer's single door. The noise of the station burst upon him as the door hissed quietly aside. Distant conversation and the motion of thousands of varied feet blending into a low roar. It intensified as he drew near to the market. And there, it was a merry cacophony, enough that they'd had to make accommodations for echolocators twice now. He flicked his tongue out in displeasure, refocusing on his task. The secondary market was, confusingly, half again as large as the primary one. The trade station had experienced a precipitous growth since it was built, and now served as a nexus for most species in the region to meet, discuss, and rob each other. Limden's job was to make sure that that was at least accomplished with contracts rather than coil guns. Among other things, he flicked his tongue again, quickening his pace. There was a small crowd around the seated humans now, silently watching them do uh, whatever it was they were doing. Limden shouldered his way through the mob until he could get a better look at the four. They each had a long, slender metal instrument, which they gently tapped out in fine, colored sand upon the decking. They were the most of the way through their intricate image of some sort, depicting a geometric circular design with impossibly rich detail. It put a hitch in Limden's step for a moment. They had made that out of sand. What were they planning on doing? Spraying it with a fixative on his decking. Limden arrived just shy of the nearest figure and reached out to tap the human on the shoulder. Uh, station and administrator, Limden said gruffly. The human looked up at him, his skin was smooth even across the top of his head. Most humans Limden had met took great pride in their hairy skulls, but none such was in evidence here. His eyes crinkled, mouth curved, and he rose with a smooth motion to stand before Limden and above him, much to the supervisor's annoyance. Supervisor, the human said, inclining his head slowly, how may I be of service? Traffic in the market has been disrupted by your... Uh activities, and for far longer than we anticipated. Lumden stepped back so that he wouldn't be have to crane his neck to glare. I understand that you have some dispensation for a cultural exchange, but the memo said that you'd be performing a public art demonstration. <sighs> it would have been courteous to mention that you'd be accomplishing this task by the slowest conceivable means. The man's face remained fixed in a polite smile. I apologize, we have been unclear. He said, the means and the time is a cultural element of our task. Yeah, of course it is, Limden sighed. Unfortunately, uh, we were not made aware of what you were doing. The pictures can't stay here. There is a particular hazard, not to mention toxicity to consider, and we can't allow any variation in the floor height that exceeds... Supervisor, the man said, his voice still low and calm. We have again been unclear. This image is not meant to remain. We will finish, and then we will leave with the sand. 
Lemden blinked, which was a rather lengthier process for his species than most. After a moment, he looked askance to the picture. How? he asked. You can't move that without damaging it. We will gather the sand with a brush and place it in a container, the man said, still with that infuriating expression of calm. The image was never meant to be anywhere but here. When we leave, we will take the sand to Tucson 1 and pour it into a river on the northern continent, so that it can flow and spread with the water. Why? Lemden asked. You're sitting here disrupting station activities. A far better part of the ten duty cycles, subjecting yourselves to severe strain, and all for no benefit whatsoever. The man's face changed, finally his mouth smoothing and his eyes opening a bit wider. They looked down at Lyndon. Lyndon felt uncomfortably observed in that moment, and resisted the urge to take another step back. You are proud of the station, the man said. Lyndon's scowl returned, well, with reason. Well, of course, it is a marvelous place, the man inclined his head again. Built by thousands, home to thousands more. Skilled people like you, who dedicate themselves to making sure all its parts work. Yet you will not be here forever. The man's eyes were fixed, unblinking. In the grand span of time, the station will not be here. The star, the galaxy, uh, after all. What benefit will it have been that the floors were clean, or the halls clear? That's not relevant to the present, Lyndon snapped. The station will be retired, yes, but it's ridiculous to expect any structure to be permanent on a stellar scale. The man's eyes crinkled again. Of course it is. Yet we build our cities and our ships. We live our lives. There is little more benefit to that at the end than what we do with the sand. You could be doing something productive, something useful. Lyndon wanted to say more, but words were eluding him. It was unexpectedly challenging arguing with someone when all they did was agree with you. The man looked down at the picture, then turned back to Lyndon with a sly grin. Something that would endure, he asked. There was a long silence. Lyndon said nothing. The human smiled. A short while later, but longer than he had intended, Lyndon returned to his post. Hey... Rendon said, tapping his screen. I saw you talking. They say anything interesting? Lyndon lowered himself into his chair. Not really. One of the screens on his workstation was dark. He saw its reflection in it, marred by the sight of a film of dust across its surface. On one corner, thermal cycling had caused the laminate that ran across the screen to separate slightly, rippling it. He reached out and rubbed it gently, to no effect. No... Oh. That needs replacing, Rendon said. I mean, uh, maybe. It cut out a while back, and I don't think that it was anything more than a secondary readout. Maintenance will get it in a few dozen cycles. A moment passed. Lyndon's finger stayed resting gently on the screen for a moment longer. No, he said. No. Now I'll do it. Those screens are a real pain to swap out, Rendon warned. A lot of little fiddly connectors to hook up. Just leave it for the tax. Lyndon didn't reply. He looked at the console, at the lines of it, the gentle sweep of the metal with its glowing inset panels, at the scratches along the side, and the part where the housing was pulling away at the corners, at the hundred imperfections that he had left for one hypothetical maintenance cycle or another. They never fixed everything up, though. It all breaks eventually anyway. Rendon sighed, turning back to his own workstation. It does, Lambden murmured. It does, but... He let his fingers fall from the panel and started requisitioning the parts. End of story. Story number two. How to Cheat Death, written by Rednell97. I really don't like this place, a meeting ground of many mystic creatures, all sharing the same name, Death. I'm not really sure why I hated you. After all, I am a Death myself. I didn't know, however, why I dreaded coming here this time. 
I had to ask a very specific death, an important question, and by doing so, admit a quite embarrassing failure on my part. But procrastination wouldn't do me any favors, so I searched him out and found him right next to the bar. Sounds about right from what I heard of him. Now, I stood in front of him, a mere shadow of the being he represents cloaked in tattered black scraps of cloth, his eyes hidden under the shadow of his hood, yet staring deep into your soul, even if, like me, you didn't even have one. And in his bony hand, an old farming implement made of a rotten wooden staff and a rusted iron blade. I spoke up. Excuse me, are you the death of humans? He reacted in a somewhat annoyed tone. I am the death of soul, and therefore their own world. But I can't chase each of them across the galaxy. That's why we are organized by regions, after all, not species. Yes, of course, sir. But I assume that you have a lot of knowledge about how to deal with them. Because, uh, you, you see... I tried placating him before he interrupted, with a seemingly much improved mood. How and for how long? I'm sorry. You tried reaping him, but he tricked you for some extra years of his life, didn't he? The death of Saul clarified. Before I help you, I want to know how he tricked you, and for how many years? Yes, he did, I admitted. At first, he just talked to me as if I were a friend. He asked if I wasn't a terribly lonely and exhausting existence, which I, I truthfully confirmed. So he asked me to rest with him just for a little while. I didn't see any problems with that, so I, so I agreed. After some time, he pulled out a game of cards and some drink. Then he taught me the rules and we played. I see, he answered. I assume he won quite often and in turn made you drunk. I swear, I didn't know it had alcohol in it. Oh, then alcohol even works on us. He called it Keshwasser, so cherry water. Why would you call it water if there's alcohol in it? I straightened myself out again. To answer your second question, he won ten years of life from me. <sighs> I'm really sorry. How do I fix this? He replied with a chuckle. <laughs> Cheating at cards and making him drunk of Keshwasa. That's a classic that never gets old. Wait, what? Uh, he cheated? Of course he did. The way we perceive the world, you literally couldn't not look at his cards. How else could he have won? He took my deflated posture as his answer and continued. And while 12 years isn't that bad, there's no fixing it. Unless he agrees to come with you of his own free will. As for the next time, just be aware of the risk and don't trust humans. Do this and you will be fine. <sighs> Damn it, my superior will have my proverbial head for this. The hooded figure remained calm. No, he won't. You're Serexi sector, right? Under, uh, what's his face? That weird seven-legged elephant guy. Uh, Terlock, death of Darius, I informed him. Yes, he's my direct superior. Why? Because that idiot let it happen six times. For a total of over 200 years of extra time. So if he gives you a hard time, just send him to me. Now, relax, sit down, take this cup, and drink up. <sighs> Fine. What's in there? Kershavasa, of course. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.